Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Given that this is uh, going to be the last uh, of the Shanghai Lectures, it will take a bit longer, so I think we will probably use the full three hours, two and a half, uh, three hours, so stay with us uh, until the end. These are the sites that I will be calling on, so I will just give a very short, at the beginning, I will just give a very short summary of some aspects that we have been talking about, <clears throat> and then we're going to have uh, three highlights, three guest talks, and after the guest talks, uh, not and myself will say a few words about the Shanghai Lectures and the future of the Shanghai Lectures. Okay. <clears throat> So today it's going to be a summary and conclusions. This is the schedule, roughly. So as you as you can see, it will be uh, so we will be uh, finishing around 11:45. So bear with us for the uh, whole time. Now today's topics are going to be basically the uh, well. You know, it's kind of an overview, a summary. It's mostly repetition, but bringing everything together. We're going to talk about this, the mindset, the properties of the real world and of embodied agents. <clears throat> and then for the design principles, uh, we don't have time for this, so I composed a set of illustrations, a set of slides for self-study, and in any case, this is all written up uh, in the book. So let me start with these, uh, you know, meta considerations, so to speak, with the mindset uh, for design. And one of the uh, one of the issues there is, you know, what level of generality and what form of the theory do we actually have? And we basically agreed that it's a good idea, given the preliminary state of uh, affairs in the field, to have rather than having you know, all equations and things, design a set of design principles that we looked at in detail. And then metaphorically, we resort to concepts from the theory of complex dynamical systems because, of course, physical systems are complex dynamical systems. Right. And then we had quite a number of very basic fundamental ideas and now uh, I would like to, if anybody is present in Salford, I would like to switch to Salford for a short comment on uh, this idea of diversity compliance, what we mean by that. Would anyone volunteer? Uh, in Hi, Salford? Rob. Hi, hey, Hi, Rob. good to see you. Nice to see you, yeah. Uh, Intelligence agents can be characterized by diversity and compliance. Uh, diversity means that uh, the, the agents has a large number of uh, behavioral, uh, diversi behavioral diversity uh, so that uh, it can respond properly to uh, particular uh, situations. Learning is a uh, power tool uh, for an agent to increase uh, behavioral diversity. Right, yes. Uh, yes. Compliance means that the, the agent uh, yes. must follow uh, the rules of its en in its environments uh, and exploits uh, these rules uh, to uh, to what you call to to uh, get a certain purpose for for certain purpose. Uh, for example, uh, 
exploit uh, wo- exploit gravity uh, and frictions for walking. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So thank you very much. I think that's you know very much to the point. So this is diversity compliance. So I think it's a good way of of uh, characterizing uh, uh, systems in that sense. Uh, now. Of course, we have been talking a lot about frame of reference, so no champagne and no uh, Swiss chocolate today. Uh, so maybe we can briefly switch to Xi'an for a short summary of the frame of reference problem, you know, where we look at the three issues that are involved with the frame of reference problem. Okay, Xi'an, are you ready? Oh. Uh, please, wait, wait a moment, okay? Yes, Here we, go. We, we can hear you. Please take the microphone relatively close to your, uh, to your mouth. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, here we have some issues of the frame of reference uh, in the null competition. Uh, our group mm, uh, lead the null uh, uh, to go uh, work through the room and uh, uh, use the sonar uh, detect the mm, physical things. So this is the one of the frame of reference. Uh, and secondly, we use uh, uh, vision, and yes, and the vision can lead our robot to work and uh, to detect some things uh, in front of the robot. And uh, uh, also, we use the um, feelings in the robot, uh, the touch. I mean, uh, when I touch the robot, the robot can stop. So this is the three issues of the. Uh, frame of reference in our null competition, and uh, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much to Xi'an. I think uh, this was, you know, it's really, I said, you know, if there is one, you know, you can forget everything that you've heard in this lecture series, but the one thing that you need to remember is really the frame of reference problem. Obvious as it is, it's always surprising how little this is generally understood, this issue is generally understood. Okay, I think uh, th- synthetic methodology is very clear, you know, understanding by building, I think we've had that many times. Also, I think the time perspectives, you know, here and now, um, development and learning and phylogenetic, you know, evolutionary perspective, that's also very clear. And then we had this uh, concept, you know, that some people consider controversial, but I think it's at the very core of any theory and any understanding of intelligent behavior, it's very closely related to the frame of reference problem, and that's the issue of emergence. <clears throat> and maybe we can very briefly switch to uh, Shanghai, uh, and uh, maybe you can uh, briefly talk about the uh, notions, the different notions and different types of emergence that we have been looking at. Yeah, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Because... Um, oh, I'll start. Okay, roughly speaking, we can say there are three kinds of emergence. The first one that depends on the individual behaviors, and the second one we can say um, it comes from the intelligent group interact with the environment, and the third one we can say uh, that comes from the different time scales. For the first emergence, we can take the ants find its food along the shortest way, as an example. And the second one, um, second emergence, we can take the Brittenberg, the Robert Brittenberg, as an example. It follows the light. There is a light in the environment, and it just uh, track the light. And uh, for the third emergence, we can take the evo- evolution of the human beings as an example. Because of long time of evolution, um, all human beings can write, can read, and can program, um, etc. And okay, I think that's all. Okay, 
Very good. I think you made a, a very complete uh, overview of this. I think these, this concept of emergence is really important. I have a couple of examples you know, to il further illustrate the point. So emergence of stable gait patterns in puppy. You know, we had this emergence of clustering in the Swiss robot. We had this emergence of a bicycle, you know, following the wall, if you remember that, you know, self-assembled bicycle. That's also an example of emergence. Here, uh, you know, like a termite mound and, and a wave in a stadium that we looked at, or in the evolutionary case, uh, the uh, emergence of block pushers. So, but thank you for, um, for your statement to uh, Shanghai. Now, what's also important to note is that emergence is not an all or none characteristics, a characteristic, but it's a continuum. You can have more or less emergence. So the more you impose your designer ideas onto the agent, the less room for emergence. And the more you basically take back your commitments, the more room for emergence there will be. Okay, now since we have been talking about embodiment and embodied agents, embodied intelligence, whatever, then uh, we looked at the characteristics of embodied agents. <clears throat> now, uh, is Osaka connected? Can we briefly switch to Osaka for some uh, characteristics of uh, physically embodied agents such as puppy or other physical agents? Yes, are you ready? Uh, we can't hear you at the moment. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Well, basically, basic, basically, what we found is that uh, agents that uh, have embodiment, physical embodiment, uh, are able to interact with the environment. So this is the the the, the main characteristic. To, that they have some physical parts that they can interact with the, with the environment and also uh, like have better communication in this case uh, with humans if we see it by, in the perspective of robots. Right, I think these are, this is a very, let's say, brief characterization of the essential components. I mean, if you take it a little apart, you can say because they're physically embodied agents, they're subject to the laws of physics. You know, they generate sensory stimulation as they interact with the environment. You know, when I'm walking, the environment travels across the visual field, but I'm all, I can also sense the, uh, the force in the muscles. Uh, we influence our environment. I mean, that's basically contained when you say interacting, we're interacting. We have parts with which we can interact with the environment. For example, when I speak now or when you spoke, just a minute ago, you put pressure waves into the environment, you know, which is a physical thing. So we always influence our environments. And because we're physical systems, we have attractor states, you know, complex dynamical systems have attractor states like gate patterns. And uh, we can perform morphological computation, which we talked about in detail. Okay, now what's also in this interaction of the agents with the environment, what's also very important is the characteristics of the real world. So maybe we can have another switch to uh, Seoul in Korea, to Sung Kong Kwan University, and maybe you can tell us yes. a bit about the characteristics of real world environments. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, in real world, uh, we want to uh, get information, uh, it will take time. And, uh, uh, and besides this, and uh, uh, the information we, uh, we want to get is very limited. But in, in the real world, uh, we cannot get uh, the entire information. And uh, uh, of course, in, in the real world, uh, it includes uh, errors. And uh, uh, besides this, uh, uh, in the real world, uh, the, um, they, are, they are not very cle clearly defined. Unpredictable. Well, unpredictable. Yeah, unpredictable. unpredictable. And uh, 
I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. Very good. I think you made uh, most, uh, most of the points that are really important. And by the way, I would like to mention that Herbert Simon, you know, who is one of the, let's say, fathers of the field of artificial intelligence, coined this term bounded rationality. And he argued that because of these characteristics, because we only have limited knowledge about the environment because of its intrinsic unpredictability and so on, decisions can never be completely rational. So we can never take everything into account. So all the actions, all the decisions that we're going to take are going to be of bounded rationality because complete rationality is not possible. Okay, <clears throat> and then we went through a whole set of design principles like uh, agent design principles for the here, that's more like for the here and now perspective. Some of these apply also to development and evolution. We looked at design principles for development. We looked at design principles for evolution. And we looked at design principles for collective intelligence. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we don't have time to go through this. I prepared a set of slides that will give you some illustrations of these design principles, but you can also read about them in the book, uh, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. What I would like to do now is basically to conclude <clears throat> this uh, summary. And uh, for those who haven't read it, it's also in the book. There is a very uh, interesting book by David Payne, Confessions. It's a, I think it must be about 20 years old. Confessions of a Taoist on Wall Street. And I think it's, it's extremely suited as a sort of global summary for, what we, for the sorts of concepts and the kind of thinking, the kind of mindset that we have been discussing here. So the story is as follows. There is a little boy called Sun Yi. In the US, they used to call him Sunny, but Sun Yi. He's born of a Chinese mother and an American fighter pilot in China. His mother dies at birth and his father returns home to the United States. So he is left alone and grows up in a monastery. His mentor and teacher is the chef, the cook, Wu, who takes good care of him. The monastery is on a high rock upon a river. One of their daily chores is to carry water from the river to the monastery up a rocky path. The boy remembers that whenever they arrived at the top of the rock, his buckets were empty all the water spilled, whereas Wu's buckets were always full. Now here is just, you know, this yoke with water buckets. And this is the conversation that ensued between Sun Yi and Wu. It was true. By some ordinary luck or skill, Wu never seemed to lose a drop, though he hurried along the treacherous stair at twice my pace. I tried to cut my losses by moving slowly, plodding my course in advance, and picking each footrest with deliberate care. I don't understand it, I confessed to him. You must know some kind of trick. Explain your method. And then Wu says, you haven't yet caught on. It is precisely this excess of method that confounds you, leaves the buckets nearly empty. And then uh, Sun Yi says, if you're so smart, how do you do it then? And Wu says, how do I do it? I close my eyes, I think of nothing. My mind is somewhere else. My legs find their way without me, even over the most uneven ground. How can I tell you how I do it? I can't even remember myself. And then he starts laughing, right? <laughs> but I think it's, it's, a, it's a very nice characterization, you know, remember like exploitation of passive dynamics, you know, outsourcing functionality to uh, morphological and material characteristics. I think it's a beautiful uh, characterization. And then there is also a cartoon by uh, Shuni Wazawa uh, of Studio Ghibli in Tokyo, Japan. So Studio Ghibli is the largest uh, manga movie producer in Japan. And this uh, cartoon is taken, I mean, I don't need to tell you who is who, right? Um, and this is also in the, so there is a, now a French for those who love French, you know, like uh, in, in Switzerland, all the kids, well, actually, they don't love French, but they are forced to learn French. 
So there is a new book uh, that uh, just was published about a month ago uh, called La Révolution de l'intelligence uh, du corps, The Revolution of uh, Embodied Intelligence. And it, there is also illustrations by Shuni Wazawa in there, just as in, in the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. You will f find this in the slides. Having mentioned that, there is now also an Arabic translation of the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, by Samia Nefti Mediani from Salford University, who has always also been participating in the Shanghai Lectures throughout. She's a great fan of the Shanghai Lectures, like so many people. And then Fatma Bautman um, in, uh, in, I think, in Kuwait. Okay, the ordering information uh, is available on the uh, website. So, thank you for your attention. So this was my very brief summary. Now, before the guest lectures, before we switch to the guest lectures, I have a short announcement of an event that we're organizing for next year, and I think that sort of fits very well with the contents of this uh, lecture series. So it's called Robots on Tour. It will be organized in Zurich in Switzerland on the 9th of March. Well, it's actually 8th and 9th of March in, uh, in the center of Zurich, not at the university, in the center of Zurich. And let me just give you a few highlights of what we're going to have there, uh, of the sorts of robots that we're going to have there. One is this emotional humanoid affetto developed by uh, uh, Professor Azada at Osaka University. I mean, it's really freaky, you know, the kinds of uh, facial expressions uh, that he can do. We're going to have the uh, factory humanoid robot Baxter by Rodney Brooks. You know, we've been talking about Rodney Brooks a lot. He is sort of the ultimate, uh, you know, pioneer in robotics, and m he will bring this robot Baxter, and modest as he is, he says, well, this is the beginning of the next industrial revolution. So this robot's going to be at the exhibition. Then you all remember the uh, Cornell Ranger, you know, this strange walking robot that can walk 65 kilometers on one single battery charge, you know, because it's exploiting the passive dynamics and recovers energy that's lost on uh, impact. And we're going to, together with Andy Arena's team at Cornell, we're uh, going to attempt a new world record. So maybe we can surpass the 65 kilometers and go to 100 kilometers, which implies, of course, because the walking is relatively slow, it will have to walk for three full days, and it's going to walk around the exhibition uh, hall. We're also going to have uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro's Geminoid. You know, he built a clone robot of himself. I don't know whether he has his own clone or some other uh, clone. We're going to have uh, Robot Junior, which is a new uh, robot that we're building at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which is almost finished. Unfortunately, it won't be able to walk, but it will be able to ride on a tricycle. And then we're going to have Davide, you know, Davide Scaramuzza, who gave a, a guest lecture here on flying robots. So we're going to have a flying robot show with the quadrocopters, and this was also covered in one of the largest uh, uh, Swiss uh, Sunday papers. Now for this event, for whoever is interested, we're looking for volunteers. You know, we need uh, between 50 and 100 uh, volunteers to help with the event. So uh, this is mostly for local students here in, in the Zurich area, but some have already said that they will come here as volunteers, but then I think you should plan on arriving on the 7th so that you will be available on the 8th and the 9th. And this you will also, information you will also find in the slides. Okay, uh, three more things. Three more things that I would like to do. It won't take very long. One is the NOW competition, a comment on the NOW competition by Tobias. Tobias, you want to come down here? Then we have the embedded competition where uh, uh, Dorit uh, Asaf will comment, and then I have something about the future of the Shanghai Lectures, and then Nathan has a closing statement. So actually, four more small chunks, but I think they won't, will not take very, very long, so ple please uh, bear with us. So I think I need to give you the uh, microphone.
So does that work? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to shortly present the, the, the outcome of our now competition that we held as an additional exercise for the, for the universities. It was uh, conceived using this uh, humanoid robot called Now by, by Aldebaran Robotics. And the goal was to direct this, this Now robot through, a, through an obstacle course um, of increasing complexity. So it started out in a, in a rectangular room, which it just had to find the exit. Then it uh, had to uh, navigate through a maze. Uh, and then in the, in the third room, navigate around some different objects with, which were spread around the room. And then the final task was to uh, walk an inclining and declining slope. Um, the, the exercise was mainly done in, in, in WebOts, which you're all familiar with. And some of the universities also had their real robot, which they uh, could use to, to solve the exercise. So we had seven participating sites, eight universities. You see them here. And in the, in the end, four of them submitted a final solution. Uh, Berlin, Chiba, Shanghai, and Tian. Um, I just have some, some remarks which yes, stood out to, to me at least when I was evaluating these four uh, submissions. I mean, one, one of the goals was to, to somehow design the solution as bio-inspired or, or as close to the principles uh, Rolf was discussing during the lectures. Um, as possible, so I think all of all of the, the submitted solutions got that right in some sense. Most of them relied on on a way uh, on the controller, which was somehow inspired by the Breitenberg vehicles, which we discussed about some some kind of reactive behavior to achieve, for example, obstacle avoidance. Or one of the groups even used it to to navigate around the the maze. Um, the second point which stood out to me is, uh, was that one group exploited the environment of the maze or of, 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 the, whole, uh, of the whole setup. They, they used the fact that all the, the, the walls were per perpendicular to each other, so they, they used it to, to, to somehow turn their now and to, to make sure it, it, it turned to the, uh, was, was turning to, uh, in, the, in, the ex in the exact angle. And then the, the third issue, which, of course, only the ones experienced that uh, were trying it out on the, on the real now, was, the, was the, the famous reality gap, so the gap between simulation and the real world. So floor material, lighting conditions, and noise in the sensor signals, that all played a role when they, when they were first trying it out on the real robot. And that, that were really some issues which, yeah, they had to overcome in one way or another. So there is a prize for this competition, for the winner of this competition, for the winning team, which was kindly sponsored to us by Aldebaran. Um, the prize consists of 250 euros, which you can use to have dinner or something. Uh, now poster a permanent software license, and they're going to have a web chat or video chat or something like that about their solution with some representative from Aldebaran. So now, uh, finally, our winner is the Humboldt University of Berlin. Again, they won <laughs> already the, the, the Frame of Reverence competition twice, and uh, also their now solution was quite the, the most sophisticated one. And um, I'd now like to switch to them to give them the opportunity to uh, say a few words about their solution and shortly present their solution. So congratulations to you. And oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm very uh, proud that we are the winners here. And um, I must say we had very, very enthusiastic students working, um, some of them working long nights on the solutions. And um, we'd like to, I'd like to present the solutions. Um, so. The, the people that were
most involved are um, Markus, Jan, Klaas, and uh, Peter. So please come here. And we're gonna we're gonna present um, how we exactly um, solve the problem. And uh, yeah, I think also that um, we learned a lot by just doing this problem and realizing how difficult it is. And at the beginning, we thought, oh, we were gonna solve this, and then we put it on a reel now, and then um, all no problem. And we didn't get that far, but apparently we went as far as one could get. So I hand over to Mark. Um, yes, uh, we decided to present it as uh, each of the three students, the solution they were involved the most. So, Nathan, if you have one of the videos. Wow. Say something to the okay. Uh, the video? As we were, I was thinking if the microphone is working or not. Oh, okay. Obviously, it's working. Um, yes, the now tries to uh, uses the sonar sensors uh, in two ways. Um, this one is the second way where it uh, turns and looks if the distance increases. Uh, if the distance increases, there must be an edge. And if the distance stays the same or if it gets less, then there is a wall. Um, this is the uh, first thing. Um, it looks for, um, in long hallways, it looks for sonar jumps because if the sonar goes above an edge, um, then the distance will increase because the wall after the edge is more far away than the wall before the sonar distance jump. And from there it knows that there is an edge too. Um, yes, then it's, I think that's probably the thing about behind this whole video. Uh, I try to keep it as, as, as simple as possible. Um, I think the whole thing has about three to 400 lines of codes. And yes. Uh, it doesn't have a working uh, reliable auto self correction for walking, so it doesn't walk the whole maze. It just walks part of parts of it. So um, one thing we wanted to do is to turn the now also um, in the right angles of. 90 degrees and or we had some problems with that at first because when we said turn 90 degrees at some computers it was just turning way too less and so we thought okay what can we do so that we have a solution which works on all our computers and so we um, considered also the ecological niche and we found yeah the floor has some straight lines and so maybe we can exploit this to uh, find out if we are standing in the right direction and so we used the bottom camera of the now and applied a Sobel filter to the image to get out the edges and checked whether we have uh, horizontal edges and then we knew that the now was uh, standing the way it should otherwise we uh, had to turn more. Um, is there also a video of it? I don't okay. think so. No. There is supposed to be also a video of it. <laughs> If we can play it, I don't know. Uh, we don't have all the videos here, but uh, maybe we can just uh, come to an end of the award ceremony because we have two <laughs> more things in the pipeline. 
Um, okay, now we will come to the end. <laughs> yeah, Some we, we more, could uh, upload the videos to the website if, if uh, yeah, for, 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 uh, the, the, for the students to view I it afterwards. I think it would be fine for we'll the community. Um, we had um, another part of the solution for the first room. It was somehow mo uh, mostly reactive, um, and the solution was something like um, he used the sonar sensors. If he came uh, too much to the right wall, then he was going more left, and uh, if he was directly standing before the wall, he was turning back uh, so that he could um, come uh, parallel to the walls and then go further. And then uh, we used the top camera, some of the upper um, lines, and made some histogram over it, and in a median from the histogram in the, in the um, image, he, he had some interesting point for himself, and he tried to go to this direction, and so he solved uh, to go into the door, because there was some interesting things in the image in the upper part. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the explanation. So I think we should come to an end here. Congratulations to you again. And uh, we're going to switch to the next presentation. OK, hello. Uh, my name is Dorit Dossoff. Um, I was uh, uh, responsible for this um, uh, embedded competition. Embedded is a toolkit I developed in the context of my uh, PhD uh, project. And so what we did is uh, we shipped um, a set of, of kits out to 12 universities and told them to, to build a robot with it. And uh, we were really happy to, to get back so many solutions from eight universities. Um, so basically the idea was uh, the toolkit consisted of, of, of electronic boards and software. And uh, the idea was that uh, you can easily connect just two servo motors and control them through a graphical user interface. And the task was basically just to, to, to let the two uh, servo motors oscillate and you could uh, change uh, easily the different settings of this oscillation like frequency or amplitude, which would be the range. And uh, so the idea was to, to build like walking robots, stable uh, like walking robots. And there was no more control to do, just to, to, to let this oscillation run on the motors. And from the, the body of the robots, um, they could build from, from these glue, glue sticks, you know, when you, you have the glue guns, and you put the glue sticks in the glue guns, so this was basically the only um, mechanical construction components you could use, and some cable ties were allowed to. So these are the solutions. So we first, uh, we, we, we award the fastest robot. So they had to measure uh, travel time for 1.2 meter. And the, th the third fastest robot was uh, from Abu Dhabi. And we can maybe show the video took seven to eight seconds. So this is basically just two servo motors oscillating. Yeah. So that's a very nice solution. Uh, the second fastest was from Moscow. Maybe we can. That's also a very creative solution. It's very nice. And the winner is for the fastest robot. Again, Humboldt Berlin. Congratulations. <laughs> it's also a, a wheeled sort of robot. As you can see, it was very close, between four to uh, seven seconds. So congratulations for that. But uh, from experience, uh, we see that wheel like flipping uh, robots are usually very fast. So we thought we should award also creativity and not so much speed. And then that's the outcome of the creativity um, contest. So we had a community to vote on it. The Shanghai Lectures uh, voted on it. 
community. Um, and th that's the third one. It's Humboldt. Again, the one you just saw. Maybe you don't need... Yeah, this is the third creative robot. And the second creative is from Karlsruhe. That's a very nice one too. Very innovative. So you have a, that's a robot. And it's basically um, the cable ties that, that actuate it. These are cable ties with, with some glue on it. That's basically the mechanism through those cable ties. It's not so fast, but I think uh, it's nice that it made it into the creativity um, best of three ranking. So the winner uh, for the most creative robot, according to the Shanghai Lectures community, is Abu Dhabi. Congratulations. Um, maybe we can show the video. Ah, it's, let me show this. That's this one. So, congratulations. We were very excited to see all your results. And I highly recommend for you, for those who haven't seen all the videos there, uh, nine robots have been built by eight universities. So you should check the videos uh, on the website. And I highly recommend you to do so. And they're really, really cool. Very ex we are very excited about the outcome. And we hope you liked it and you enjoyed working on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dorit, uh, for the presentation, and thanks to all the groups who participated in the two uh, competitions. <clears throat> I think that was a nice uh, outcome in terms of also, uh, let's say, the whole community, the Shanghai Lectures community participating in uh, these uh, exercises. Okay, so uh, we are now, let's see if I can... Uh, uh, how, how do I do this? All right, so I think I have to get rid of these. Okay, and then I come to the second last part of the uh, Shanghai Lectures, which is about something about the future. Okay, can you see this? Yeah, okay. Right, so um, we're, almost, we're almost done, just a couple of minutes, just a couple of more minutes. So it's about the future of the Shanghai Lectures. <clears throat> so just a bit of background, we started in 2009 at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and the host was Professor Wei Dong Chen, who has been participating over the years. So this is the fourth year. I think we have established a great community, and as we have seen in these uh, competitions, you know, there is, a, I think, a good uh, spirit, a good competitive, but a good cooperative spirit. My time at the university is limited, so we have to look for other uh, solutions. Should we continue with the Shanghai Lectures? and what should be the format. And then we have been discussing with people. Some people have made suggestions. Yes, we should continue, perhaps with a new format, perhaps with a new content. And it has been suggested uh, by some people, for example, by Professor uh, Asfour in Karlsruhe, that instead of just having one lecturer, basically like myself, plus guest lectures, to distribute the lecturing tasks to the entire community, Say, for example, having uh, uh, Tamim in Karlsruhe talk about grasping or Odbia about grasping or uh, learning by demonstration, uh, having uh, Professor Bonsignorio in Madrid giving lectures about the theoretical foundations of embodied intelligence, Professor Chen or Professor Yu from Chiba delivering some lectures on assistive robotics, David Escaramuza from the AI Lab in Zurich uh, to talk about vision-based uh, flying robots and so on. 
And so these, these could, could be a shared organization, you know, of, of uh, these uh, people that have expressed an interest in uh, continuing the lecture series. And uh, in any case, Nathan and myself will be very happy to help set everything up, you know, because, and we can also uh, continue to pro provide the infrastructure. So the infrastructure of SWIFT will uh, be available so that we can maintain our community that you see here. And uh, as a per personal statement, I would like to say it would be nice to continue one way or other. As I said, you know, I'll be happy to help. But the format can change, the contents can change, and let's see what happens. So a big thank you to everyone who has participated, to the students, to the sites, to all the technicians who have supported the project. Uh, so thank you very much. Now, uh, I think uh, uh, I would also like to say thank you. Of course, you all know Nalton by now. You know, he has been the one, uh, the super organizer and manager of the uh, lecture series, and uh, he has a final uh, set of slides. Do I? S I think I, I have them here. Which one is it? This one. Okay, so he has a set of slides uh, that I would like to show. Okay. Not on. Oh, you have a microphone. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, this is it. It has been a great ride, sometimes a bit bumpy. As you all noticed, we had some technical issues from time to time. Maybe in the exercises, things didn't work uh, as we expected. Video conference sometimes has some uh, dropouts. But all in all, it was very, very uh, interesting and and fun, at least for the people here who worked on it. Uh, so the whole thing started in 2009 when Thierry Bücheler was managing the whole project. And uh, since then we have, to, we have explored 3D worlds and community websites, video conferencing, discussions in a 3D world. Uh, we've brought students together. Uh, we had technical issues that we mostly could overcome. We had new forms of collaboration and really amazing guest lectures. And uh, we, what we wanted to do is provide an interactive experience to students and lecturers and researchers all over the world. And I think we have achieved that, and that wouldn't have been possible without many sponsors and collaborators. You see them here on my slides. Um, so Cyberbotics, they sponsored WeBots for our exercises in Wolf. Uh, they sponsored the chat feature on the website. We had competition sponsors by Aldebaran, Embedit uh, was sponsored by Seed Studio. Then we had a competition sponsored by Max and Motor in 2009. We had initial funding from Hasler Stiftung and from Liechtenstein, and of course a lot of support, uh, infrastructure, counseling from Colabcon, uh, Sun, well, neither Oracle, Kitely, Hen Architects, St. Paul College, ETH, and many more. And last but not least, Switch. They provided the infrastructure and the initial funding for the Shanghai Lectures project. And uh, their motto is uh, serving Swiss universities, but it should actually be serving universities around the globe. So uh, very big thanks to Switch, to Thomas Berecke, Paolo Wieting, Andit Binden, Andres Eschlimann, and many others for, uh, for your support and help during the Shanghai Lectures. And... Um, more thanks to all the guest speakers. So we had three fantastic speakers today. We had many more in the last uh, four years. Thank you to all of those who contributed to the guest repository with fantastic talks. Thank you to all the sites who participated. So we have more than 40 universities around the globe participating either with uh, weekly uh, lectures or guest lectures, sometimes at two or three in the morning or seven in the evening. So uh, it was really amazing to work with the international uh, university community. Thank you to all the responsible people at these sites, so all the professors and helpers at each of the universities. I cannot list all of them. Um, all the people in charge, uh, it was really a pleasure working with you, and I hope we can continue working somehow. 
Special thanks to my colleagues uh, in Zurich, the assistants who prepared the uh, exercises, helped with the website, especially Tobias Klauser, who took care of the website this year and fixed many bugs and helped students, also was in charge of the now exercise and competition, and Dorit Asaf with the uh, embedded uh, competition. Uh, here in Zurich, most of you don't see it, but in the back of the lecture hall, we have a big technical setup that is uh, only possible to use thanks to Mark Sulz and Markus Lehmann, who helped us set up the lecture hall in, in the summer and operated all the equipment during the lectures. Also, thanks to all the tutors, technicians, programmers, helpers everywhere at all these sites. Special thanks to Rolf for making it possible and keeping the community together. I think um, if, if you can stay around for whatever the future holds, uh, the Shanghai Lectures can live on. And um, these are, I don't know, like 200 people around the globe who worked on the Shanghai Lectures. So thank you all. And a special thanks to you, the audience, the students. We make this whole thing for you. And we hope you enjoyed it. And if we have future Shanghai lectures, we hope that you stick around. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, point to the interest group on the Shanghai Le website. We have an interest group future of Shanghai lectures, where you can uh, uh, write your opinions on how we could or should or should not continue. And you're also uh, invited to send email to Rolf and myself uh, with your opinions. And in January, I'm going to send around a questionnaire that you can fill in online and uh, give me some feedback on what you think the Shanghai Lectures ought to be. And uh, that's basically it. So I hope to see you again sometime somewhere in the virtual global lecture hall. Thank you for your collaboration. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, I think we can have a discussion on the, you know, in the forum and, and on the website that Nathan set up. We can also think about having a video conference in which, you know, same style as here, in which we actually discuss about the future. So, and any any ideas are of course warmly welcome. Send mail to Nathan and myself. And then uh, we can see uh, what happens. As you know, I believe in emergence. And so let's see what emerges from this. Of course, we can impose a top-down design on the whole thing, but we can also minimize the design and see what emerges from the community, which would be very much in the spirit of the Shanghai Lectures. OK, thanks again. I don't know whether uh, someone has a, has a, a vote, would, would, would like to say something for the sort of a final statement uh, in the global virtual lecture hall. If, if, that's, if that's not the case, then I think uh, we just uh, call it a day and let's see what comes out of it in the future. So thank you once again very, very much for you know, making the effort and participating in this lecture series. Thanks. Bye-bye.